come directly to us and I will be able to ask it for you live during today's event. Stay with us throughout the entire presentation today. You'll learn so much about living well on your journey with diabetes. And in addition, we would very much appreciate you staying with us at the end of today's event. We'll have a short, less than five minute survey where your feedback is so very important to us. We wanna make sure that we're taking all of your feedback and using it to make better programs going on in the future. Joining our program today is a great step towards taking care of your health. Because of the link between diabetes and heart health, the American Diabetes Association, in collaboration with the American Heart Association, has launched No Diabetes by Heart with support from founding sponsor Novo Nordisk. The No Diabetes by Heart initiative provides tools and resources for people living with type 2 diabetes to learn how to reduce their risk of cardiovascular disease. So as part of this initiative, the ADA is holding this free educational Q&A once a month, the second Tuesday of every month. We'll cover information and tips to help you take care and charge of your health. If you know anybody who would benefit from this event, please share this information with them. In addition, let your healthcare team know that we're, we're holding this event the second Tuesday of every month at 2 p.m. Eastern time. When you live with diabetes, it may increase your risk of heart disease, it may increase your risk of stroke and kidney disease. So make sure when you see or speak to your doctor or your healthcare provider, you ask about what steps you can take towards reducing your risk of heart disease and what you can do in terms of prevention. If you want to know more, please visit nodiabetesbyheart.org for more information and resources. And now I'm extremely pleased and super excited to introduce our guest expert for today, Dr. Caitlin O'Brien. Caitlin O'Brien is a graduate from the University of Connecticut School of Pharmacy and completed her PGY1 pharmacy residency at the VA Boston Healthcare System. She currently works as a clinical pharmacy specialist at Boston Medical Center, the largest health safety net hospital in New England. And at BMC, she worked in internal medicine and primary care for over six years and recently transitioned to adult endocrinology practice as one of six certified diabetes care and education specialists to support the diabetes clinic. She was awarded the Massachusetts Young Pharmacist of the Year Award in 2023 and is currently serving as the chair of the Massachusetts Coordinating Body for the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. A warm welcome to you, Dr. O'Brien. Thank you so much, Susan, for having me and thank you to the ADA for this wonderful event. I'm looking forward to spending the next hour with you and the listeners answering any questions that come through. It sounds great. So Dr. O'Brien, to start off the conversation, understanding everything about medications can be extremely overwhelming and sometimes comes along with some anxiety, especially when you're taking medications for type two diabetes and other conditions such as high blood pressure and heart disease. So what can we do to improve our knowledge about medications that are prescribed to us from physicians or from other prescribers on our healthcare team? Great question. Um, and so I think it's important to have a pharmacist involved in the healthcare team, whether that be like me embedded in the clinic or having a reliable pharmacist in the community setting where a patient picks up their prescriptions. So um, the person or family member um, caring for the person with diabetes has a safe place to ask questions about medications, drug interactions, side effects, when's the best time to take this medication and how the medications work. It can be really overwhelming um, when you start a new medication to understand how it fits into other medications. And so a pharmacist or another uh, educator can be a great resource for a person living with diabetes or their caretaker to answer any questions. Um, and I think it's another great piece of advice is to come to new appointments with an updated medication list or even your medications because a lot of health systems um, 
may not have an integrated medical record. So we don't always know what the person is taking. And so if they can come with a list of medications that will help uh, start the path with a new provider on the right foot. That's such great advice to always be prepared. Um, that's really great advice for sure. And for those of you who are just joining us, welcome to today's Ask the Experts Q&A. Our topic today is your medication questions answered. And as a reminder, for those of you who are on the phone, if you do have a question, please press star three, that's star three on your keypad, and someone will collect your questions and put them in a queue so you will have the opportunity to ask them live. And if you're participating online, please type your name and question in the field below the streaming player. And always remember to please hit the submit button for your question. And Dr. O'Brien, I have to tell you that we have a number of different questions coming in. So let's start and kick it off. Um, let's start with Barbara, who is calling in from Ohio. Barbara, please ask your question live to Dr. O'Brien. Hi, Dr. O'Brien. I'm on metformin, 1,000 milligram. How safe is metformin? Thank you for your question, Barbara. Um, and I think I will just say, uh, I am here to answer any medication questions, but please also consult your healthcare team if you um, have further questions. And since I don't have full access to all your medication or medical history, Barbara, I will share um, some general information. Metformin um, is um, or has been kind of the first line medication in the treatment of type 2 diabetes for several years. Um, so we have a lot of data around its safety and efficacy in using the medication to help uh, control your glucose um, in type 2 diabetes. And so 1,000 milligrams is kind of a middle, I would say a middle dose. It can go up to 2,000 or if it's a different formulation, 2,250 milligrams. And so depending on how well your kidney function is, so that's how... Uh, how your kidneys filter your urine or your blood to make urine, um, the dose would be specific to that kidney function. So 1,000 milligrams is a safe dose if you have normal kidney function. Um, it might be a safe dose if you have somewhat reduced kidney function, but it is a highly effective medication at lowering blood sugars, um, even at the 500 milligram dose. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Dr. O'Brien, and just um, piggybacking off of the question that Barbara just asked, I think so many people are concerned when they are prescribed a medication about the side effects and sometimes read a lot about the side effects online. What can somebody do who is concerned about side effects? How would they approach their physician or their prescriber about discussing side effects that they may be concerned about prior to starting the medication? Whenever a new medicine is being discussed at an appointment, I think it's a great conversation to have with your prescriber, um, asking what to anticipate. How soon will the medication work? What are potential side effects of this medication? What should I be looking out for? Um, and so um, here in Massachusetts, where I practice, I know I'm a pharmacist, um, but I'm also a prescriber um, under the state laws. I can prescribe medications within the diabetes space. So whenever I consider starting metformin, um, for example, I always review potential side effects. And for those who are on metformin, you may know it sometimes is some GI discomfort, so some abdominal pain, potentially loose stools or diarrhea. Um, so I, I kind of inform the patient what to expect and then how to mitigate those side effects. And so sometimes taking metformin with food can prevent that side effect from occurring. We also typically start metformin at lower doses. Um, and slowly increase to avoid having those side effects up front. And so there's strategies that can help prevent or avoid those side effects. Um, and for metformin in particular, there's also an extended release. Um, so the bottle may say XR or ER, and that type of formulation can also prevent or minimize the side effects that we anticipate with the IR or immediate release metformin. Thank you so much. I think that that's so helpful to everybody listening today. I'm going to read one of the questions that I know is going to come up several times in today's discussion that came to us online from Jonathan. 
I want to know more about semiglutides, side effects, especially Manjaro. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. So for those listeners who aren't familiar with either of those medications, semaglutide um, falls under the brand name Ozempic, and Manjaro is the brand name for a medicine called terzepatide. And the semaglutide is in a family of medicines called the GLP-1s, um, which stands for glucagon-like peptide. Um, terzepatide is similar. It's in a slightly different class, um, but it works in a similar way. Um, and the way these medications work is uh, to, in a food dependent manner, meaning once you eat and there's food in your stomach or in the digestive tract, insulin will be secreted. So this medicine helps you to produce your insulin from the pancreas, which in turn lowers your glucose or keeps your glucose um, in our target range after a meal. It also helps to delay the digestion of the food, preventing kind of a large spike in the blood sugar after a meal, and it helps you uh, increase the feeling of fullness. So it actually sends signals to your brain. And so the way the medication works is kind of important in knowing what potential side effects to anticipate. Um, and the side effects that are most common with this class of medication might be some, uh, again, GI. Um, so if we're slowing the digestion down, um, some people, if they overeat, might get a little bit nauseous or some abdominal bloating or pain or gas. Um, and then if the digestion is slower as well, some people experience constipation because that food isn't moving through the GI tract as frequently. And it's a little confusing, but on the flip side, some people also may have diarrhea. So kind of in that GI family of belly pain, um, nausea, vomiting, it doesn't happen in everyone. So again, when I um, am discussing this class of medications with patients, I do uh, review these side effects, as well as, like I said, with the metformin, ways to mitigate or prevent these side effects. So eating smaller meals, avoiding greasy or high fat foods can help prevent some of that upset stomach or discomfort. It's very helpful. And what does GLP-1 actually stand for? All right, stands for glucagon-like peptide. And these are receptors that are in our um, digestive system. And so this medicine is a, a re it blocks that receptor to allow for more GLP to be in that area, allowing for more insulin to be secreted for the you know increased feeling of fullness. Um, and it helps uh, kind of stable, stabilize the glucose after the meals. Um, and one thing I didn't mention before when Jonathan brought up the class of medicines is it also has been shown to reduce some of the concerns about heart disease that you mentioned at the beginning, Susan, is it's been shown to reduce heart attack and stroke. And those are some major complications that we often see in type 2 diabetes. So not only does it lower your sugars, um, it's also being used for cardiovascular protection. And for some people in the media, media, excuse me, you may also have seen that these medicines have been approved in the treatment of obesity. And that is how it relates to that increased feeling of fullness, delayed gastric emptying, appetite suppression. Um, and so these medicines have a lot of uses that and benefits that we can use in, in individuals with type 2 diabetes. Absolutely. And I think we're going to hear a lot more about different iterations of the medication over time and a lot of different insurance coverages issues. And we'll see how the cost of these medications changes as more iterations of it do come out. Uh, Dr. O'Brien, we have another question coming in from Rose, who's in Pennsylvania. Rose, please go ahead with your question. Rose, are you there? Okay, I think that we are not hearing from Rose, so we can go to, I can read Rose's question. Rose asked, how many different types of insulin are there and how many times do you switch up insulin brands safely? I thought that was a great question. That is a great question. Thank you, Rose. Sorry we couldn't hear you, but I'm glad Susan was able to ask it on your behalf. 
So there are quite a few types of insulin and there are two, I would say, main categories. There's a fast acting insulin, which helps to cover your glucose with meals. So when you eat food, uh, specifically carbohydrates like bread or rice or pasta, potatoes, those foods turn into sugar once your stomach digests them. And so the fast acting insulin or sometimes called rapid acting insulin, mealtime insulin, Prandial insulin, bolus insulin, there's a lot of names and they're all interchangeable. Those are the insulins you inject with regards to your food. Um, and then there's a long acting insulin that is a once a day, typically a once a day insulin, and that's injected um, any time of the day that you've kind of figured out with that works with your schedule. And that covers your glucose levels when you're not eating or in the fasted state overnight in between meals. That's called the basal insulin. Now, within those two categories, there's a number of generics and brand name products. And um, the insurance uh, typically will select one or two within that class that they will have on your formulary. So unfortunately, it's very common for an insurance to kind of flip and flop between um, the insulins from you know a year to another year. And so I could say that I've experienced these switches before. It usually happens on January 1st, sometimes in the middle of the year. Um, but the plans may change who they're contracted with. Um, for example, the, that those long-acting insulins, typically when you switch from one to another, um, they are usually a unit-to-unit -unit conversion. So if you're on 25 units, uh, one insulin, and your insurance wants you to change, it most likely will be um, 25 units of the alternative insulin. Um, and so from a safety standpoint, it's, it's usually pretty safe to switch from one to another. Um, and the other good thing is that most of these devices, if you're using insulin pens, they're all fairly similar. So it doesn't require you to be re-educated on injection technique. The needles are all compatible for the pen, so you don't need new prescriptions for needles or anything like that in order to administer the insulin. Um, there are some cases where you may want to have a discussion with your doctor about staying on an insulin. Um, if there's a particular insulin that's working really well for you, um, or if you're on a different type of insulin, like maybe a concentrated insulin or ultra fast or ultra long acting insulin. So there are some nuances between the insulins. Uh, but to kind of answer or summarize the question, um, there are different types of insulins. And they all have different action profiles to help target different types of rises in your blood sugars. So you may be on two types of insulin, a long and a short acting. Thank you so much for that. We have another online question from Aaron, and Aaron asks, for generic and brand name medications, is there a major difference in efficacy? And I think that that's something that we're asked so often. Yeah, um, so the, the generic version of a medication usually comes out several years after the brand name has been on the market. So the brand may, their patent may expire, and now this medication is available for other manufacturers to produce. So it's the same kind of chemical drug or the, the actual active ingredient. Um, and so they don't really necessarily do any new trials with the generic medication. So since it's the same molecule or the same component, um, we can determine that, or we can surmise that the safety and efficacy of the generic medications are equivalent to their uh, brand name medications. And with the generics, when they come out, that does also lower costs, which gives improved access to patients um, for the medications that are more affordable. Um, but in my experience, I've had many patients successfully transition from like a brand insulin to a generic once they became available. Okay, thank you so much for that. We have a question live from Ike, who is in New York. Ike, can you please go ahead with your question? Yes, I'm type 2 diabetic. Uh, I'm taking Robesas. They uh, I have medicine to lose weight, but I want to gain weight. I'm concerned about my kidneys and my high blood pressure being high. What can I do to come back there? I want to gain weight, not lose. That's a great, great question. Um, and I, it sounds like, um, you know, the medication Rebelsis is, is a, an oral version of that glucagon-like peptide that we spoke about before when um, somebody else asked a question about semaglutide or Manjaro. So 
Rubelsus is the oral semaglutide. So it works the same way, even though it's orally um, administered and not an injection. And so similar to how the injectables work, these the oral semaglutide can um, have you lose weight. So I would consult with your, your primary care doctor, your endocrinologist, or your, I know you said your kidneys and your heart. So you have a cardiologist or a nephrologist to see how much weight you are losing over time. If that if that's something that is of concern to your doctor, perhaps the Rebelsis dose could be reduced. Um, there are three doses available for Rebelsis, uh, three milligrams, which is starting dose seven and 14. So if you are on the highest dose, maybe we, you know, your doctor could consider lowering the dose if you were concerned about significant weight loss. Um, it is important with the GLPs to ensure you're eating a balanced diet. So that would include protein because oftentimes with the GLPs, you can lose both fat and muscle mass. So eating a balanced diet, including lean proteins like fish or chicken, turkey, eggs, um, tofu, if you're, if you're a vegetarian, those things are gonna be incorporate, important to incorporate in your diet. Um, it sounds like you also have concerns about you know, um, your heart and maybe kidneys. Um, there is another class of medications that we haven't touched upon yet, so maybe this is a good time to bring them up. They're called SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, and these are an oral tablet or an oral pill that you can take um, to lower your blood sugar levels by um, peeing out or excreting out through the urine excess glucose. So these work at the kidneys, um, but they also have evidence or benefits in chronic kidney disease and heart failure, um, as well as heart attack. And so maybe if you're not on one of those medicines, maybe that's an alternative that you could suggest because like the GLPs, the SGLT2s have benefits for heart disease. Um, and so I think if you have these concerns, Ike, that it would be a great opportunity at your next appointment to bring those up with your, like I said, primary care doctor, cardiologist, whoever you are seeing next, um, and okay. maybe discuss alternatives to your medications or you know, maybe lowering the dose or talking to a nutritionist about how to put on some weight through increasing your protein intake. So I think you have a lot of options there. Is that a good book I can read? Excuse me? Is there a good book you recommend me to read? Oh, a good book. Um, a book about medications, diet, diabetes. What what type of book are you looking for? Well, diabetes for my help. Diabetes, yes. Yeah, so there's a lot of good books out there. Um, I like the book Think Like a Pancreas by Gary Shiner. Um, that teaches you a lot about what's happening in the body uh, with diabetes. Um, that is a good one. And then um, I liked another one, uh, and both of these authors live with type one diabetes, which is a little different from type two, but they do have personal experience. Um, the other book I liked was, um, and this is more around like living with a chronic condition, was called um, Diabetes Sucks and You Can Handle It. Um, and so that gives you a lot of tips on like the emotional burden of you know, taking medications or checking your blood sugar every day or trying to eat a balanced diet and like the internal process that you might go through living with uh, a new diagnosis. So those are two that I've enjoyed um, and I don't, I don't live with diabetes myself, but I've read them and do recommend them to patients. I don't know, if, Susan, if you have other uh, book recommendations as well. Those are two really good ones. And Ike, that's a fantastic question. I would also remind everybody, and we have this on the slide, to check out all of the information on the ADA website and on no diabetes by heart um, information.org, no diabetes by heart.org. And also to check out um, ADCES, the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists, also has a tremendous amount of information and resources. So check those out and thank you, Ike, for that fantastic question. And Dr. O'Brien, just bouncing off that, because I think that you've brought this up a few times and so many of our listeners are alluding to it. Sometimes on, when we're prescribed a medication from a physician or from another prescriber, a nurse practitioner or somebody else on the healthcare team, we can be a little bit uneasy about discussing the medication, the side effects, or what we want to know more about it. And I think you're discussing dosages and titration. You brought it up about metformin starting at a lower dose. How would you suggest 
that we approach a physician or another practitioner who is prescribing a medication? What can we do in the discussion to be prepared to talk about some of our fears or some of these side effects that we're feeling so that we feel confident in taking a medication? And this is, of course, in addition to what we're doing in terms of lifestyle with nutrition, adequate physical activity and sleep. But if a medication is prescribed and we're anxious about it, or we want to discuss the amount that we're taking of the medication, um, or we're taking it along with vitamin supplements, how do we bring up that discussion with our doctors? Great question, Susan. I think it's so important to feel empowered in your um, healthcare. You are part of the team, you are the center of the team. And so, I think having a few questions, um, you know, kind of either written down before your appointment, writing down notes of what you want to cover in the appointment um, can be so helpful because once you get to the appointment, you check in, there's a long line, they're run, the doctor's running late and you need to get updated labs and there can be a lot going on in a short visit with a, a physician or a nurse practitioner. So kind of going into your appointment, having a few questions written down. And then always having kind of a few questions, like if a doctor is suggesting a new medication, I would I would kind of come with a few questions. What should I expect? How soon will this medication lower my blood sugars or lower my blood pressure? Um, what side effects should I expect? What's the best time of day to take this? Would this interact with any of my other medicines? Should I separate them? Should I take this one at night? And so having a couple of those questions kind of already prepared so that in that moment, you're not overwhelmed uh, by everything that's going on in the suggestions. And they want you to go to the lab and then the pharmacy and then the insurance needs a prior authorization. It can be really overwhelming. I think the other thing is um, to remember that the pharmacist filling the prescription should be available as well. If you pick up, um, I know some insurances do require, you know, filling in a mail order pharmacy, but if you fill at a pharmacy, you know, within your health system or in your local neighborhood, the pharmacist there could also answer your questions because sometimes questions come up after the visit with the doctor um, and sometimes you can't reach the doctor's office um, right away. And so the point of picking up the prescription might be another opportunity to ask the pharmacist uh, about potentially they have your other medications you're filling. They can do a quick review and see if anything interacts um, or if you should separate any vitamins from a specific medication. And so that's another resource you could use. That might be after the doctor's appointment if other questions arise. I, I completely agree. And I and I always say, if you purge what you're thinking or all your questions onto paper, you feel very organized and very secure going into that appointment where you have limited time to ask those questions. So I love your advice there, Dr. O'Brien. We have another great question coming in from Frank. Frank is in New Jersey. Frank, please go ahead with your question. Uh, hello, Dr. O'Brien. Uh, thank you very much for taking my question. Uh, my question has to do with uh, uh, cortisone injections that I recently started taking. Uh, I think it's going to be infrequent, but it seems to have elevated my my uh, glucose levels quite a bit. Uh, and I, kind of my question is, is that normal, and is there something I can do about it? That is a great question, Frank. Um, and cortisone um, or steroids, Sometimes they're used in injections for arthritis um, right. or maybe a pill. Like if you had a pneumonia, you might get a, a steroid in a um, couple of days of a steroid. They were used a lot during COVID for the COVID pneumonia. Um, some people get steroids for the treatment of gout. And so these short courses of steroids, while they may be temporary or infrequent, like you said, with the injection, um, some people will get an injection once a year in their shoulder or their knee. Some people get it every three months. And this, that is such an important thing to know if you have diabetes, that those injections or the pills of the steroids, prednisone, um, dexamethasone, those medicines can make your blood sugar go up. And they can kind of do it in, to some degree, very high levels. So if you aren't used to seeing high numbers, um, you might be a little bit surprised if you check your sugar and see a two or a three or even a 400. Um, depending on the type of steroid, the effect of the high blood sugars may only last a few days or may last up to a week or two. Um, so it always depends on the amount of steroid um, and the duration of the steroid. Um, and so if this is a one-time thing, um, 
maybe you don't need to do anything because it's in the past, but if you do plan to have another steroid injection, it might be great to notify your primary care doctor, endocrinologist, whomever is working with you to manage your diabetes to see what interventions can be taken um, ahead of time or kind of in the days following the injection. Now, it kind of depends okay. on what you're currently taking for your diabetes medication. So um, depending on what you, you know, you're prescribed or another person would be prescribed is if they're on insulin, um, maybe just for two or three days, you'll use a little bit more insulin. Um, if you're on a pill, that might help lower your blood sugars. Maybe the dose would be increased for a couple of days. Maybe you would, if you're not on insulin, maybe if it's just, you know, a short term injection, maybe you would just kind of watch, watch your numbers, see if they go above a certain number, then call your doctor. Um, so everybody's kind of different because each of the steroids can affect the glucose differently depending on the route of administration of those steroids um, and then the type of steroid and how long you're going to be on the steroids for. Um, steroids are also commonly used um, around like chemotherapy treatments. Um, and so sometimes those patients might get them every two weeks. And so they might need a more intensive plan with their doctor or healthcare provider on how to manage the steroid. We call it steroid induced hyperglycemia. Um, so I think the best thing for you to do, Frank, would be next time you have one planned, if you're getting them you know, on a quarterly or uh, annual basis, is to check in with your team about these are my current meds, this is where my blood sugars are currently, and then I'm gonna get this injection, what, what should I do um, to kind of mitigate the, what I know happened the last time? So basically what you're saying, uh, uh, the elevated uh, numbers should be temporary for a week or so, and, and maybe I can compensate for it in some manner. Yes, and I would, I would not compensate without discussing with your doctor, just so you, know, you don't take too much of one type of medication, uh, but it is temporary, um, and it is to be expected. All right, thank you very much, doctor. You're welcome. Thank you, Frank, that was a great call. So as a reminder, if you have a question, and I know that we have a lot of them coming in and you're calling, please press three on your keypad and we will collect your question and you may have the opportunity to ask it live. And if you're joining us online, please put your question and your name below the streaming player. And please remember to hit the submit button so that we do get your questions because all the questions that we have coming in right now are just fantastic and really outstanding. So let's go to another question that we are getting online. This one comes from Londa and she asks, how do vitamins D3, magnesium, vitamin C affect my diabetes medication? I'm currently taking metformin and Trulicity. Um, thank you for, for that question. Um, off the top of my head, I cannot think of any concerns. I believe you said D3, magnesium, and vitamin C. Um, yes. And it's it's common that, you know, some people with type 2 diabetes may have uh, bone, bone, bone density issues or osteoporosis. Um, and that's common with type 2 diabetes, and it's common with uh, an aging population. So I wouldn't discourage you from taking the vitamin D as it's important to the bone health. Um, the vitamin C, the one kind of potential that pops up um, in my head is that if you are monitoring your glucose with a continuous glucose monitor, yes. the Freestyle Libre um, specifically, that sensor can interfere with high doses of vitamin C over 500 milligrams, the Freestyle Libre 2 and 3. And so I would consult with, if you were using that device, consult with your physician, uh, diabetes care and education specialist, nurse practitioner, whomever you were seeing to see if there was a different CGM that you could use or um, if you could lower your dose of vitamin C. Um, and that interaction would just make the values on the glucose monitor slightly less accurate. If you are monitoring through finger sticks or not monitoring at all, which is totally fine if you're on metformin and trulicity, then nothing to worry about there. That was such a great pickup, Dr. O'Brien, because we have a number of people who live with diabetes who may also have wound issues, and then they are prescribed very high dosages of vitamin C. And if they are on a CGM on one of the Libres, that can interfere with some of the readings. And I think in with a lot of healthcare professionals, that's just not 
common knowledge in why some of the readings might be off. So that was a really great pickup to, su to suggest that to everybody who is attending today's event. Fantastic. And as a quick reminder, at the end of today's event, we are going to have a very quick survey and we would really appreciate your feedback on today's event as we want to use your feedback. It means so much to us for development of future programs. So thank you so much for that. So let's go to another live question. And this is from Michael, who is calling in from Las Vegas. Michael, please go ahead with your question. Yes, I, I take uh, three different pills and I was wondering what's the best time of the day to take the medication. Sure, do you, um, uh, I couldn't I couldn't tell if you said the names of the medications. I heard you say three different pills. I take uh, metformin twice a day, uh, Genuvia once a day, and Jardius once a day. And I also take the Trilicity shot once a week. Okay. Um, so the metformin, like I mentioned earlier, to avoid upset stomach or or any you know diarrhea or anything like that. I would suggest taking that to eat breakfast and dinner. So when you say twice a day, um, taking it with food. So if you have two meals a day, take it with those meals. If you have three meals, kind of the first and third meal would be appropriate. Um, the Genuvia can be taken anytime that works for you. Um, the way that works is uh, kind of similar along the same lines as the GLP. Um, it, it only works when there's food in the system. So you don't have to worry about taking it on an empty stomach and having low blood sugar because it will only be turned on or activated once you have some food in your body. Um, Jardian, same thing. Uh, you can take it once a day and it's okay to take metformin, Genuvia, and Jardians all together. There would be no interactions there. Some patients of mine, just from their an anecdotal experience, prefer to take the SGLT2s, which is Jardians, in the morning. Um, the way that medicine works is by helping your kidneys to excrete glucose through the urine. And some patients may note increased urination, and so they would prefer to not take that at night. Um, but you can take it any time of the day. And then you mentioned Trulicity. Um, so that is a once weekly injection. So whatever day of the week that you can kind of stick to, I would say um, I would consult with your, with your primary care provider, endocrinologist. Um, there is not a lot of literature to support using Genuvia with Trulicity, so the DPT-4 with the GLP-1 um, because of how they work so similarly. Uh, but some, some providers kind of do that um, just if they think it's going to be a little bit more helpful, but uh, it has not been shown to be more efficacious and potentially maybe have um, some more side effects like, you know, lowering the blood sugar too much or um, maybe some GI, some of those GI side effects. So that's one thing I would suggest is maybe if you feel like you're on too many medicines, that might be something that you could cut out um, and like have to take less less pills because that Trulicity injection is is very uh, effective at lowering the glucose. You may not need the Genuvia. Thank you so much for that question. Let's, we have time for a couple of more questions. I know that there are so many coming in and they're all great. Um, this next question is from Janice, and Janice, you, Janice is calling from Alabama. Janice, please go ahead with your question. Hi, uh, you covered part of our question as far as how the Jardians work, but if you're taking Jardians, can it cause you to have kidney stones? Um, did you say if you're taking Jardians, it can cause kidney problems? Is that what you said? Uh, yes, kidney stones, S-T-O-N-E-S. Oh. oh, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yes, kidney stones. Um, if you had kidney stones after starting the Jardians, I would, I know I've said this a few times, consult with your, your prescriber, um, but that may be something that you want to hold off on the medication. Of course, kidney stones can be painful. Um, it may be from something else, so the doctor may want to figure out what the cause of the kidney stones are. Um, but the Jardians, yeah, like I said, that's the SGLT2 medication that works at the kidney 
to help you pee, pee out or urinate out extra sugar. So perhaps like more, um, you know, there's more going through the kidney through the nephron. Perhaps there was something going on there with kidney stones, but it may be something worth talking to the doctor about is like, is it safe to continue? Is there some sort of benefit um, beyond blood sugars, like with heart failure um, or cardiovascular concerns that, you know, might outweigh the risks of developing kidney stones again in the future. And so I think that's an important discussion to have. And as Susan brought up earlier, like write the questions down, advocate for yourself, you know, if that's a side effect that you think might be related to the medication, then definitely bring that up and have that discussion with your with your prescriber or your healthcare team. Thank you so much for that question. All of these questions coming in are really quite excellent. So let me go to one more question that's being asked online, and this is from Terry. Terry says, so far I'm not having any problems, and I was wondering if I if what I'm doing right now, um, which is maintaining my nutrition program and my exercise program, do you think that I will have to use medications in the future? That's a great question, Terry, and um, congratulations. That's an amazing, uh, amazing feat. Um, I think it's so important. Um, I know this session is about medications, but it's so important to realize that diabetes can be um, controlled or improved with lifestyle modifications, um, weight loss, uh, physical activity, changes in your, your lifestyle, your food. And so that's um, really great that you took your, you know, those changes and put them into action. So what I would suggest is that continuing those efforts, following up with your primary care team, having an A1C check, you know, every six months to a year to ensure that you're staying under that you know, number, whether that for you is 7% or 6.5%, that's the A1C we use to see kind of how diabetes is staying in target overall. Um, so if you have, you know, something we could call diabetes in remission, meaning you are not using any medications, your number is under that 7% or 6.5, whatever you and your doctor have kind of come to terms with as your goal, um, then you may be considered to not, no longer have diabetes but I would encourage a close follow-up to ensure that it does not progress back into a type two diabetes. Um, for most people who are diagnosed with type two diabetes, their beta cells, which are the cells in the pancreas that make insulin, um, those are already kind of declined in how much they can work or how much insulin they can produce. And so it's important to kind of keep those lifestyle um, positive you know, changes with maintaining your physical activity, eating a balanced diet. Uh, that's so important to prevent that progression from, you know, that, that A1C mark that you've achieved to type back into that type 2 diabetes range. And so type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease, meaning that over time, those beta cells can no longer keep up with the production of insulin and they get a little tired. So when I'm talking to a patient, I like to call it um, like this wet sponge. You're doing dishes and all of a sudden the faucet stops and there's no water. That's the insulin. And that sponge, you can kind of squeeze it and get a little bit of water and soap out. Um, but eventually that, that, that sponge is gonna dry up. And so that's kind of how I describe type two diabetes is, um, you know, for a while you, you'll still make insulin. Um, your body will still respond to that insulin, but eventually you may need to supplement your lifestyle um, and physical activity with a medication. And so um, those things that would I would consider as a clinician would be like, how old are you, your family history, um, if, you've gained, if you've gained weight, if you're no longer able to sustain some of those things that you're doing, like if you have an injury and you can no longer be physically active, I may be monitoring your A1C on a more close basis um, to ensure that we're staying on top of the, that progression and kind of catching it so we can intervene with maybe a single dose, one tablet medication, um, rather than not checking it uh, for years and, and that progression kind of um, not being caught. And so I think you're doing all the great things with your program um, and maintaining that is, is no easy feat. So I commend you on that. And um, I think just being, having close follow-up with your, your team is gonna be important. Um, just to make sure that you're staying in your your target 
range um, without those medications. And to follow up on that discussion, many people are asking why would medication dosages change over time? Either the dosages change or the medication change. So you might be doing well on a certain medication, but that may change your doctor or your prescriber may advise a change over time. Why would that happen? Sure, I think there could be a lot of reasons. So I know a few have come up. So sometimes we start with a low dose to avoid the side effects. So maybe that's just the, the changes like that we're starting low and are, we're gonna hope that we can get to this dose. And so perhaps that's one reason. Another could be the insurance, which we've talked about. You may have to switch from one medicine in a class to another based on the formulary. Um, and then the third might be what I just talked about is diabetes can be progressive. And so if you're doing really well on these two medications for five or 10 years, and you're working on your diet and exercise, it may just be that that pancreas is not, not making any insulin and we need to add another medication. And so um, it's, it's never to make anybody feel like a failure. Their pancreas just may no longer keep up and they may need additional medications. Um, and then I think the fourth reason that comes to mind would be as we learn and discover new medications, we're learning about other areas that there's benefit. So, um, you know, 15 years ago, we didn't know anything about these, you know, SGLT2s or GLP1s. And when those first came out, we didn't really know that they had benefits in terms of weight loss and um, preventing heart attack and stroke and preventing heart failure and chronic kidney disease. And so as we know more about these medications, there may be more options that will provide um, not just glycemic benefits, meaning glucose benefits, lowering your blood sugar, but cardiovascular or metabolic benefits. So protecting your heart, protecting your kidneys, helping you lose weight, which is all part of the kind of approach to managing type two diabetes. And so they may be added not because your blood sugars are not where we want them to be, but for um, protecting your kidneys or protecting your heart. Just excellent. That's really great information. And Dr. O'Brien, are there any final thoughts or any takeaways that you want to share with all our callers and all their fantastic questions that are coming through today? Well, I would just like to say thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, be a resource for all of the callers and participants. Um, it's been a pleasure answering your questions. You've had amazing questions. Um, and I just want to encourage you to advocate for yourself, whether that's with your your healthcare team or your local pharmacist to ask some more of these questions as, as you reflect on today's sessions and more questions arise. Um, it's so important to have a voice in your own uh, healthcare journey and being able to ask these of your primary care doctor, your nurse practitioner, your cardiologist. We are all on the same team and it's so important to know your medications and why we are suggesting them to you and what the benefit will be. And so um, the only medication that works is the one that you take. And so it's so important mm -hmm. to be um, open and honest with your healthcare team about maybe not being able to take medication due to side effects or costs or fear of injections because there are other options and we can work with you to find what best fits your lifestyle and your needs. That's such a great takeaway that the only medications that work are the ones that you're taking when they are prescribed for you. So one more final thought. Some people have difficulty, because I bring this up all the time, with opening up a prescription medication. Can you give any suggestions on how to discuss that with your pharmacy when you're picking up a medication to make it easier to get the bottle open? Yes, so most pharmacies, you can request um, the non-safety cap. So when you get a prescription bottle, um, usually you kind of have to push down and that's to avoid any safety with children in the home or infants, toddlers, pets, um, anything like that. And so you can request a different cap on that vial of medication that makes it a little bit easier to open. Um, you can also request at certain pharmacies, I know my health system has one, we have adherence packaging. So some, um, some places may have a program where they can enroll you, where they bubble pack or blister pack your medication. So you don't have to remember which ones do I take at 8 a.m. and which ones do I take at 8 p.m. when I go to bed. And they can maybe organize them as well if that is something um, that would be beneficial for those maybe with memory impairment um, or difficulties taking medications on their own. 
Absolutely great advice. Thank you again for all of that advice. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you again. Next slide, yeah. please. Thanks. So next steps would be to remember to take all the advice, tips, support that Dr. O'Brien spoke about today and speak to the doctors and members of your healthcare team about your risk for heart disease, stroke, and kidney disease. And remember to talk about ways that you can reduce your risk and what you can do in terms of prevention. Go to nodiabetesbyheart.org and sign up for the free newsletter. And I know that one of the callers also spoke about other resources and books. This is a fantastic resource, so please check out nodiabetesbyheart.org and register for our future events at diabetes.org experts. Sign up for diabetes self-management education and support classes near you or online. We have the information here. And if you would like, you can call 1-800-342-2383 or call 1-800-DIABETES or email us at askada at diabetes.org to request a digital copy of How to Thrive resource. And that can help you on your journey, of course, with diabetes as well. Thank you all for your fantastic and great questions that you all called in with and you wrote in. We really, really appreciate them. And, and my sincere apologies if we couldn't get to all your questions. There were so many good ones. I tried to look at ones that were similar so you were able to ask them live or I was able to read them, the ones that came in online. And if you would, please remember to stay at the end of the event for a really quick survey. Your feedback is everything to us. It's so important for developing future events. So please stay online, stay on the um, program for that for another few minutes. And we really wanna thank Dr. O'Brien. Today was a fantastic, fantastic event. Thriving with Diabetes takes a team and we're all here to support you. Very special thanks to all of you for joining us today. We know that your time is so important and we appreciate you being here. And on behalf of the ADA team, we wanna thank you for all of your time and efforts. Please join us um, for our next events, which are coming up um, for No Diabetes by Heart events that are coming up on May 14th, high blood pressure and type two diabetes, the impact on health and on June 11th, how to determine a healthy weight for you. Both of these, we have other fantastic guest experts, just like Dr. O'Brien was today. You can register for these events and future events at diabetes.org slash experts. And please share with your community and your health team as well. All events are from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time. And if you have any questions about this event, please email askada at diabetes.org. Please include Ask the Experts Q&A in your subject line. And thank you all again. So now we can move into our survey. As I promised, this is going to be a nice quick survey, but we would really appreciate your feedback. We appreciate you participating in the American Diabetes Association's Ask the Expert event. We hope that you can continue to answer these questions that are coming up now. So let's begin with these questions. Please let us know your level of agreement for these statements. The first question, question one, this event met my expectations today. For yes, press one. For no, press two. And if you're unsure, please press three. Again, question one, this event met my expectations today. For yes, please press one. For no, please press two. And if you're unsure, please press three. And if you feel you can use more support for managing diabetes, please check out diabetes.org website, the ADA website. There are so many links and updated information that can help you along your diabetes journeys. Just explore the website and flip through it there's just information on every topic. You can go into the search bar and search topics that you want to learn a lot more about. Okay, let's move on to question two. Question two, 
I will attend another Ask the Expert event. For yes, press one. For no, press two. And if you're unsure, please press three. I'll read that again. Question two, I will attend another Ask the Expert event. For yes, press one. For no, press two. And if you're unsure, please press three. If you're looking for some great menu ideas or for some delicious recipes and healthy recipes, please check out diabetesfoodhub.org. That's diabetesfoodhub.org. You can find some delicious recipes, low carb recipes. If you're um, watching your sodium intake, you can also look for recipes that are lower in sodium as well on diabetesfoodhub.org. Okay. Question three. This event improved my knowledge about medications. This event improved my knowledge of medications. For one, for yes, press one. For no, press two. And if you're unsure, please press three. This event improved my knowledge about medications. For yes, press one. For no, press two. And if you're unsure, please press three. Did you know that approximately 37 million people live with diabetes? And I mentioned that huge number because you are not alone. So if you're looking for peer support, the ADA has peer support in local state offices, diabetes camps, great online forums, and much more. On the diabetes.org website, you can find a section on community. So diabetes.org slash community can offer much more information and support. Peer support is so very important. Question four. I intend to use the knowledge I gained for my or my loved one's next appointment with a healthcare professional. Question four, I intend to use the knowledge I gained from my or my loved one's next appointment with a healthcare professional. For yes, press one. For no, press two. And if you're unsure, please press three. If you want to learn more about medications, this was a great event on medications, go to the ADA website, diabetes.org, and type in medications and treatments. You can go to diabetes.org and type in medications and treatments, and that will bring you to a lot more information, articles, and resources to learn much more about medications. Question five. Before this event, I felt confident talking to a healthcare professional about my or my loved one's diabetes medications. For yes, press one. For no, press two. And if you're unsure, press three. Before this event, I felt confident talking to a healthcare professional about my or my loved one's diabetes medications. For yes, press one. For no, press two. And if you're unsure, please press three. As we discussed today, there are a number of oral and injectable medications that may be prescribed to help you manage your diabetes. To learn more, you can go to diabetes.org health and wellness slash medications. There's a lot of information on oral medications and injectable medications on the diabetes.org site. And we have one final question, and I appreciate you staying on for this survey. Question six. After this event, I feel confident talking to a healthcare professional about my or my loved one's diabetes medications. For yes, press one. For no, press two. And if you're unsure, press three. After this event, I feel confident talking to a healthcare professional 
about my or my loved one's diabetes medications. For yes, press one. For no, press two. And if you're unsure, please press three. We sincerely appreciate your time during today's event and doing the survey, and we look forward to engaging you on a future Ask the Expert event. Please visit diabetes.org experts to learn more about upcoming events. Thank you again for joining today.